Hello everybody and welcome to another One Piece chapter review, this time for chapter 1014, 1014, which I believe could be marking the beginning of the end of Act 3. The cover shows Law, we find out that he's a Hunter x Hunter fan, and the inspiration behind this cover page comes from a Japanese children's folktale called Ikyu-san and the Tiger. Ikyu-san was a young monk who was known throughout Japan for being very witty, and so one day one of the lords of Japan wanted to test his wits. So he called him over to his castle, and he told Ikyu-san that he had this painting, this, this screen painting of a tiger, and that he was having problems with it because each night, the tiger would leave the painting and cause a lot of bad things to happen. So he asked Ikyu-san to catch the tiger in the painting for him, and Ikyu-san said okay. So he waited until nightfall and prepared himself to fight the tiger, and then once the night had actually fallen, Ikyu-san asked the Lord to get the tiger to come out of the painting so that he could catch it. And so the Lord then said, there's nothing I can do to get him to come out of the painting because he's in a painting. And so EQ said, well, if that's the case, then he's not dangerous at all because he can't come out of the painting. And so that's how Ikyu-san was able to outwit the Lord's request and gain his recognition. Of course, in the actual chapter, the tiger actually is coming out of the painting to get some food, and I took that as a nudge to Kanjido's ability, which we do end up seeing in this chapter. And the chapter starts off the exact same way that this arc started, with Luffy falling into the water. So he doesn't get to fall on land, we do get to see a brief panel of him underwater, and I know some of you were saying that one of the possibilities here is that the polar tang actually shows up to pick up Luffy underwater because, as we remember, part of Law's crew stayed behind in the submarine. After Law switched himself and some of the scabbards onto Onigashima Island, the remaining harp pirates decided to resubmerge and head off into the depths. Also, Wano is connected by rivers, so if Luffy gets a ride on the submarine, he'll be able to get to the flower capital a lot faster via the sub using those river routes. Anyway, Kaido tells Bao Huang to announce his victory over Luffy throughout Onigashima, so she does that, and we get a double page spread of the Straw Hats and others finding out about Luffy's defeat. I believe Marco has been busy fighting King. We don't get to see King in this chapter, so I'm assuming it's because Marco has been able to keep him at bay. And speaking of Marco, Bao Huang says that Luffy Luffy had the highest bounty on the enemy side, which automatically means that Marco's bounty has to be under 1.5 billion. The background of where Frankie is appears to be on fire, so I'm assuming that that's the fire that Orochi started. So that's another thing that needs to be dealt with, like how they're going to put out that fire. We get a shot of Jinbei versus Who's Who, and this is one of the fights that I really want to see more of, because we've seen very little of it, but in the meantime we can tell that Who's Who is like pulling a Sanji, he's like kicking Jinbei. And then another thing is that if you look at his left arm, he's actually using his sword. He's unsheathed his blade, and I guess this is also why he transformed into a human, so that he would be able to wield his sword better. That being said, we still need to see a lot of these prehistoric Devil Fruit users' hybrid forms. So Who's Who and Sasaki should be able to wield their weapons in hybrid form as well. Kaido notices the giant hole that Big Mom opened up with Fulgora using Hera, and he uses it to go back inside because Bao Huang told him that they had spotted Momonosuke. That whole scene of the transmission, though, really reminded me of the Battle of Hogwarts where Voldemort like talks to everybody inside of their mind. Like he, he's gonna make an announcement and he's like, you have fought valiantly. If you continue to resist me, you will all die one by one. I do not wish this to happen. I speak now, Harry Potter, directly to you. You have permitted your friends to die for you rather than face me yourself. This time, I shall enter the fray myself, and I shall punish every last man, woman, and child who has tried to conceal you from me. It also reminds me of that scene in Thriller Bark where Kuma shows up and he's like, I'm here for Luffy, the government wants him, so as long as you hand over Luffy, I will spare all of your lives. And then everybody there is like, you want us to betray our Nakama? Forget about it! And I kind of like the fact that Luffy is KO'd because it kind of throws the ball to other characters. So it's like, okay, so the main character isn't operating right now. What do we do? We gotta figure out something here. So I kinda like that aspect of it, or the potential of that. The official translation kinda makes it clear that the reason Luffy lost in this instance is because, like I said before in one of the previous reviews, Luffy is still kind of a noob when it comes to infusing himself with King's hockey. So I think Luffy was barely just getting used to being able to combine his King's Hockey 
with his Gomu Gomu no uh, attacks. Because Kaido says, like, what did you call it? Gomu Gomu no what? So it just makes it seem as if Luffy was just barely beginning to test out being able to infuse his King Saki with his Devil Fruit power. And so, like, you know, maybe trying out Gear 2nd or Gear 3rd with King Saki or something like that. Gomu Gomu no! And then a new name for an attack using the properties of his Devil Fruit power and the properties of his Conqueror's Haki. Which I feel like that combination with his Devil Fruit power plus his King Saki is what is going to lead into Gear 5th. But in the meantime, I guess we're just stuck imagining what a King Kong gun or a Kong gun would look like being boosted up by Conqueror's Hockey. I think Kaido's Joy Boy comment is probably the most important part of this chapter, so I'm going to wait to talk about it till the end. We see Yamato on the third floor opening her way up with her club. It appears that she's still trying to get up to the rooftop, which is now officially a waste of time, because as of this chapter, Kaido is no longer on the rooftop. And it's kind of funny, because if Yamato had just stayed put, she would have ran into Kaido anyway. So I don't know if this means Yamato is going to go back to where she was, or if she's going to continue heading upward towards the rooftop and then get there and realize, wait a minute, there's nobody here. Regardless though, this is just Oda prolonging the anticipation for a Yamato and Kaido reunion. Like he doesn't want Yamato to run into Kaido just yet, because it's obviously gonna lead to a very big reveal. It could be about Yamato's history with Kaido, it could be about Yamato's mother, it could be about Yamato's devil fruit power. There's just a bunch of stuff that could be revealed once Yamato and Kaido interact with each other. There's a very important scene there with Momonosuke reading Odin's journal, and I think he figures out why he's so important to the grand scheme of things. I think he was about to tell Kinemon what he learned, but then Kanjido and Kaido showed up, so he couldn't make the reveal. I mean, he's obviously reacting in the same way that we saw him react back when he first learned that he could hear and talk to Sunisha. So unless it's Sunisha again who he's hearing, which I doubt, because if it's the elephant again, why would he react the exact same way? Like, he already knows what the elephant sounds like, and, and what their voice is like, so, you know, there's no reason for him to overreact in that way. So I definitely think that he has to be hearing another animal. And this animal has to have enough range of vision to have seen what was going on in the rooftop. Because there were moments before where Momonosuke was able to describe what was going on in the rooftop, even though, like, he's inside the dome. And so that feature is very similar to the feature that we saw back in Zo, where Momonosuke was essentially able to share Sunisha's line of sight. And so he could look through Sunisha's eyes, and that's how he learned that it was Jack who was attacking the elephant. So there has to be something like that going on here, where he's connecting with another creature that is near Wano. Now the reason for why Momonosuke is so important here is because if you remember back in Zo, when Luffy and Momonosuke were hearing the elephant's voice, Pedro said that Odin and Roger could also hear the elephant's voice, but they couldn't communicate back to it. And Luffy says the exact same thing. He says that even though he can hear the voice, he can't talk back to it. He can't communicate with it because it won't listen to him. So the reason for why Momonosuke is so important is because he's the only character that we know of right now who can actually talk back to the elephant and give it orders. And if he can talk to the elephant and give it commands, it's very likely that he will also be able to command whatever creature he's hearing right now. Now, does Momonosuke's ability to command these very large, apparently ancient creatures open up the possibility of him being an ancient weapon? Possibly, yeah. I kind of find it interesting that the two characters that we know of who can talk to these ancient giant creatures have like a pink theme to them. Like they have the color pink associated to them. Like for example, Shida Hoshi, she can command the Sea Kings because she's Poseidon and she's a pink mermaid. And Momonosuke, like, you know, he can talk to Sunisha, this, this giant elephant, and he's a pink dragon. And Oda's kind of a jokester when it comes to subverting expectations. So when I hear the phrase ancient weapon, like I automatically think about like something that's really intense and like, oh, manly and something like that. So I wouldn't put it past Oda for him to say, well, you, you think that that's what they look like? You think that that's what they are? Well, that's nice, but no, that's not what they are. In this story, the ancient weapons are these two pink characters 
who are both crybabies. Another thing here is that we know that the entrance to Wano is being guarded by whirlpools. And when Odin comes back to Wano, he actually warns Roger's crew that if a ship gets on the wrong current, it'll essentially send the ship crashing into some of the cliffs and you'll never be able to make it into Wano. So the currents or the whirlpools around the island help Wano remain isolated. And so we know that Odin's goal, which he ended up inheriting to the scabbards, right, was to open up the borders of Wano. And so I always thought about like, what's causing those whirlpools? Is there something that's creating those currents so that ships can't get through? And if that's the case, then by the end of the arc, we have to get rid of those currents so that, you know, the country is open to other ships and they don't have to go through that. So whatever creature Momonosuke can communicate with, assuming that that's a creature that he's able to hear, right? Can that creature control the whirlpools? Is that creature controlling the whirlpools? Like, is, is that creature responsible for having that protection around the island? Because if that's the case, then Momonosuke can command the creature to stop doing that. So is there a mythological Japanese creature that has the power to create sea currents or has the power to create whirlpools? My first thought was Lugia from Pokemon because I remember in the game, in order to catch Lugia, you have to go to these like underwater caves or something, but those caves are surrounded by whirlpools. And so it turns out that Lugia is based on this god called Ryujin, who is like this dragon that lives in the ocean floor. And then it turns out that Ryujin is known by another name, and that other name is Ryo. And so of course we know that Ryo is what the people of Wano call the armament hockey that they use. I personally would want us to find out that the creature is actually hiding inside of Mount Fuji, because I think if the creature is in Mount Fuji, that would offer him a perfect view of Onigashima and the rooftop. Which again, that's, that's what Momonosuke was reporting on. That he could see what was going on on the top. So yeah, there's definitely an animal involved in this Momonosuke thing. I think Joy Boy tweeted out that like he thought it was like a giant turtle. So just to get things straight, we have Kaido in this arc, who is like Gyarados, right? Like Magikarp turned into Gyarados. I think that the creature responsible for the whirlpools around Wano is Lugia or a Lugia type creature. And then Joy Boy thinks that the island of Wano is actually on the back of a Torterra. Now I know you can think, wait, like what if Gyarados, what if Kaido is the one responsible for the whirlpools around the island? Uh, but that can't be the case because Odin says that that has been in place way before even Kaido got to the island. Those currents were activated to protect Wano from a very powerful enemy. And so those whirlpools, they go back centuries, way before Kaido even showed up. We head over to the live performance floor to see that Chopper has taken a page out of Big Mom's book in terms of how to handle Queen. Unfortunately, we do see that Chopper and some of the allies have been hit with candy arrows, courtesy of Peros Pero. And we also see that Queen has been able to pretty much tank everything that Monster Chopper has thrown at him. And so back in Fishman Island, we learned that Chopper could only stay in Monster Point for three minutes. That was his limit. We found out that even post time skip, after he uses it, he can't move around for like several hours. Robin had to be the one to hold him and move him around like a stuffed animal because of the after effects. Apparently there was a conversation between Caesar and Chopper that we didn't get to see that took place between Punk Hazard and Dress Rosa. It should have happened around chapter 698. Apparently Caesar offers to multiply the time limit of monster point times 10. So instead of it only lasting three minutes, he wants to push it up to 30. So it seems like the modification already took place. And of course we know that each time Caesar experiments on something or create something, it has catastrophic side effects. And so I think that one of the side effects of Chopper using this new formula from Caesar is that it's actually going to trigger his awakening, but it's going to trigger his awakening in a very bad and unhealthy way. And so the reason for why I'm pretty sure this is going to cause a problem for Chopper is because we still need to see Vegapunk at some point in the story. And Vegapunk is a doctor, right? So Chopper still needs to learn something 
from Dr. Vegapunk that he can use in his own practice. And Oda also said in an SBS that once Vegapunk gets introduced into the story, he will be using Vegapunk to explain more about Devil Fruits and what they really are. So Chopper's Devil Fruit power having some type of malfunction perfectly foreshadows the Straw Hats meeting up with Vegapunk eventually so that Vegapunk can cure Chopper or can help him come up with a cure to that problem. It's literally the exact same thing that happened with the kids back in Punk Hazard. Caesar was experimenting on them for giantification purposes and he was also feeding them the NHC-10 drug so the kids became addicted and developed pretty bad side effects. And so by the end of the arc, Smoker and Toshigi are in charge of taking the kids to Dr. Vegapunk in order for them to get top-notch treatment. I think the exact same thing is going to happen with Chopper in this case. Like, he's going to have to meet Vegapunk to undo the damage that Caesar caused him. Queen's mouth laser beam just reminds me a lot of the Pacifista's laser beam. And so that's potentially another connection to Vegapunk, because we know that the reason for why the Pacifista have those laser beams installed is because Vegapunk was able to replicate a bit of Kizaru's devil fruit power. And so that's what the laser beams are based off of. And so I would be very interested to see what would happen if Queen shot his laser beam at Sanji, and then Sanji activated his raid suit shield against it. Like, would the raid suit just resist the beam, or would it be able to deflect it to change its direction? Would it be able to absorb the energy and then weaponize it, or something like that? Anyway, Pedos Pedos just shooting out some arrows, so at this point we're just waiting on Nekomamushi to show up. I think I've heard the word beam be used in Japanese. Like, I think in Drum Island, like Luffy says, oh, it's a beam of that, beam of that, beam of that. So beam, I think, is used in Japanese. So I think the reason for why Queen's attack is called the Black Coffee Beam is because beam sounds like bean. So it's a pun on bean. Kanjiro turns into Odin again to try and get to Momonosuke, and so by the end of this chapter we are led to believe that Okiku, Kanjiro, and Kinemon, all three of them are either dead or they are fatally wounded. Now this is One Piece, and we've seen people get stabbed and shot and get fatally wounded before and they turn out to be just fine. So if all three of them are actually dead, that would be very unlike Oda. Based off of their dialogue slash last words, I think Kiku and Kanjiro are the ones that are more likely to die. That being said, I would not be surprised if all three of them end up being just fine. At one point, Kinemon did say that after the war, he wanted to reunite with Otsuru, so he has that going for him. Then again, we are led to believe currently that Otsuru actually died in a fire because of Hold'em. I thought the art was fantastic in those scenes, especially the panel with Kinemon slicing Kanjiro up. I like how Kaido just comes out of nowhere like BOOM! Like he's playing whack-a-mole with his Conqueror's hockey club. He actually breaks both of his swords, both of his blades shatter, and to me the best thing that could happen here for the story is for all three of them to actually die. Kinemon, Okiku, and Kanjiro. If they end up being dead, I think that would be a great, great development for the story because it raises up the stakes and it could also make way for a very interesting character moment for Luffy in the sense that he might be faced with some guilt because he got defeated and he wasn't there to protect his friends. So that could make for a very interesting character moment. That being said, like I don't think anybody is really dead, but even if they're not, I, I think that just having Kinemon be defeated in a very similar way to how Odin was quote unquote defeated by Kaido I thought was very poetic. Kinemon gets taken out in an attempt to protect Momonosuke, which is pretty much exactly what Odin was thinking that he was doing back when he got taken out. So I like the student-master parallel. The final panel of the chapter shows the weapon factories of Udon, so if Luffy ends up taking the Polar Tang over to the Flower Capital, he could probably rest inside for a bit before having another go at Kaido. I really liked both Okiku's and Kanjiro's quote-unquote last words. Obviously, Okiku's relates to her epithet, which is Kiku of the Lingering Snow. So when the snow begins to melt, that means the dawn is near, because obviously the, the dawn is the sun, right? The sun begins to rise, come up in the morning, and so the sun would melt the snow. Um, and so I really like that. That was like a really poetic, really good line. And then Kanjiro makes a reference to his life as an actor and how the curtain is finally closing. So I really hope that that means that the act itself, act three, is also coming to a close. Because we know that in Kabuki-style plays, there's usually five acts. And the third one is the tragedy, all right? So third one is the tragedy, fourth one is the climax, and then the fifth one is this very short 
act that just kind of like concludes everything very, very quickly. It's like a very short ending. So yeah, this, this seems like the tragedy of, of the arc. And my hope is, is that like we find out what Momonosuke is hearing, like we find out what that creature is, and then we just cut and that's the end of the act. And we go over to the rest of the world and figure out what's going on with Sabo, Vivi, and possibly Shanks. The official translation actually offers us another hint as to why Kiku will not die from that Kanjudo wound. And so basically I'm just gonna read you what Kanjudo says to Kiku as he stabs her. Like as he's stabbing her, he says, it's only fair the wound you already gave me will prove fatal. So it kind of makes it seem as if Kanjudo is returning the favor and that the wound that he's inflicting on Kiku is pretty much the exact same type of wound that Kiku inflicted on him. So the wound is probably like the exact same level of severity. And we know that after Kiku injured Kanjudo, like he was on the floor for some time, but eventually he got up and now he's running around and you know, he's doing all this stuff. So if Kanjudo survived that, then I think all Kiku needs is a doctor. All right, so now for Kaido's Joy Boy comment from the chapter. In the official English translation, Kaido says, you couldn't be Joy Boy either, it seems. And then in other translations, including the official Spanish translation, he says, you couldn't become Joy Boy. So that kind of makes it seem as if Joy Boy is a title and it's a title that you need to earn. So we know that when Roger went to Laugh Tale, he basically said, man, Joy Boy, I wish I had been alive during your time. I wish I would have met you because you left behind a really great story. A story full of laughs, which actually speaks to one of the main themes of the series because the objective is not just to get to Laugh Tale to find the treasure, the objective is to have a great adventure on the way to the treasure. In fact, according to Luffy himself, the journey itself is way more important than the actual destination. And so it's obvious that in order to obtain the title of Joy Boy, in order to become the new Joy Boy and be worthy of his treasure, you need to have certain character traits. Because like Whitebeard said, just finding the treasure itself is not going to be enough. You find the treasure and then that's going to end up causing a war against the world government which is why the person who finds the treasure has to be of a certain caliber. And they also need to fit in with Joy Boy's ideology. And not only that, but you also need to find the treasure at the right time. Because if the ancient weapons aren't ready, you won't be able to do much of anything with what you find in Laugh Tale. It's kind of what happened with Roger. After he finds the treasure, he tells Rayleigh, yeah, it looks like we were just too early. And so the significance of that in terms of how it relates to this chapter is that it really brings up like one of these like fundamental questions about the nature or the message of the story. Is Joy Boy a title that you have to earn, that you have to work for, or is it actually a title that a certain character, in this case Luffy, is already destined to have? It's like a Neji versus Rock Lee situation, right? Like natural born genius versus hard work. And I think it's very interesting that Kaido is the one bringing this up because if you remember the last time, the last thing we heard him say to Luffy before he knocked him out was they were fighting, Kaido was in hybrid form and he told Luffy, it looks like even when you're in trouble, you can still smile. So Kaido knows something about the will of D that he's not disclosing. We know Sebek was a D. So was Sebek's goal before getting defeated to become the new Joy Boy. Because what could have happened is that maybe Sebek was getting very close to obtaining that title. And so the world government was like, no, you, you need to shut this guy down. And so we don't care who it is. So Roger and Garp just team up against this guy and shut it down. And eventually after the Battle of God's Valley, Roger gets sick. And then Roger is the one who actually gets closer to becoming Joy Boy. But I'm guessing that because he was sick, the world government was like, ah, don't worry about this guy. Like, you know, his time is limited, so there's not much he can do if he actually finds the treasure. So, of course, we know that Roger passes down his light and creates this new pirate era. And so now I'm thinking that, you know how, like, the Gorosei ask Emu, they say, like, which light do you want us to extinguish from history? Because now I'm thinking, like, wait a minute, were the posters that Emu was looking at during the reverie, were those like supposed to be Joy Boy candidates? 
Like, was Emu ruling out future potential Joy Boys? I do think that Destiny does have to play a role in this, not only because it's a story and everything is pre-planned and predetermined anyway, uh, but also because, like, there, there's some quotes from Rayleigh. Uh, there's one during the Odin flashback in the anime, uh, and it actually references to a manga moment where Roger meets Rayleigh for the first time, and Roger's like, hey, Rayleigh, you want to turn the world upside down? I think we were destined to meet. And then Rayleigh kind of reflects on it back in Sabodi, and he says, Maybe everything does happen for a reason. So it does look like moving forward, Destiny will play a role in Luffy's fate. Maybe not to the extent of like what happened in Naruto, where we found out that Naruto and Sasuke were both reincarnations. So maybe not to that extent. Uh, and my hope is, you know, from this chapter is that maybe it's a little bit of both. There's a quote from Forrest Gump that I really like that says, I don't know if we each have a destiny or if we're all just floating around accidental like on a breeze, but I think maybe it's both. So please let me know where you think that Oda is headed with this Joy Boy comment that he had Kaido make in this chapter. Is it destiny? Is it choice, right? Because uh, both of those things, freedom and destiny, have been mentioned and have been given weight, a lot of weight, in this series. So let me know, is it one or the other? Is it a combination of both? Where do you think this Joy Boy thing is headed? That's gonna do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. I hope you have a great week. I thought the chapter was definitely a good one. Thank you for all of your support, and I will catch you guys later. Bye.